Final Fantasy VII is one of the most famous games of all time. Even if you've never played it, you've certainly heard of it. It's been more than 20 years since the game was first released, and in that time, the video game industry has seen staggering innovation and massive growth. Still, Final Fantasy VII remains one of the most highly rated, most beloved, and most talked about games in history. Whenever there's a list of the best games ever made, Final Fantasy VII is sure to be on it. And if you ask people who their favorite video game character is, there's a decent chance they'll name someone from this game. Why? What was so special about Final Fantasy VII? That's what this video is going to answer, along with the obvious follow-up question. Does the game still hold up today? This video contains spoilers for the original Final Fantasy VII. It does not contain spoilers for the remake. Final Fantasy VII had the perfect timing. In the mid-90s, Square were already well-established as the kings of Japanese role-playing games, alongside their rivals, Enix, with whom they would eventually merge to form Square Enix. The Final Fantasy franchise dated back to 1987, and in their home market of Japan, each new title released had soared to new heights. In addition, side projects like Secret of Mana and Chrono Trigger resonated with fans and seemed to prove that Square had the Midas touch. But at this time, RPGs was a niche market. Outside of Japan, the series had only seen limited success with only three of the six entries in the series being released in North America and none of the games seeing a European release. Still, hardcore fans around the world modded their consoles and imported the games at exorbitant prices just for a chance to experience the deep, rich storytelling and lovable characters. Final Fantasy's fame spread through word of mouth while the general public remained painfully unaware. In 1996, Square were coming off of Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger, both of which had been tremendously well received by RPG fans. At the time, Square were firmly identified as a loyal Nintendo cohort, so when they announced that the highly anticipated sequel to Final Fantasy VI would be released for the Sony PlayStation instead of the Nintendo 64, it came as a shock to fans. For a lot of kids my age, Square's decision to support Sony single-handedly decided the war of the new generation of consoles. Certainly for me it did. I had been a Nintendo fanboy, but the risk of not getting to play the sequels to Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger seemed at the time to be a fate worse than death. At this time, Sony's PlayStation was struggling to gain ground against the Nintendo 64 and the Sega Saturn. With Final Fantasy VII becoming a PlayStation exclusive, Sony saw an opportunity to bring a killer app onto the market. Not only would Final Fantasy VII become the first game in the series to get a worldwide release, but it would be bolstered by a massive marketing effort. To promote the game outside of Japan, Square and Sony launched a $30 million ad campaign that featured television commercials, magazine articles, comic book ads, and more. Suddenly, it wasn't just RPG fans who were salivating over Final Fantasy VII. Now everyone was talking about it. Even people who'd never played video games before were eagerly waiting for the new Final Fantasy to come out. Every month, gaming magazines counted the days to the release. The internet had recently broken through to the mainstream and word of the game spread like wildfire online. Even after all that hype, the game did not disappoint. At the time, Final Fantasy VII was the most expensive video game ever produced, and the team that worked on it was described as the largest development team of any game up to that point. The enormous budget allowed Square to take full advantage of the capabilities of the PlayStation hardware, and this translated into a dramatic leap forward in how the creators could realize their vision. Where Final Fantasy VI had been constrained to scenes that took place on entirely flat 2D landscapes, Final Fantasy VII used pre-rendered 3D backgrounds that employed depth, camera angles, and scaling of character models to present a huge variety of different environments. Fields and dungeons could be stretched out into vast open spaces to give a sense of scale and scope. Key scenes benefited from the ability to show environments from different angles and perspectives, essentially using camera work to add cinematic language and narrative power to the scene. 
The world map allowed for a fully three-dimensional representation of a globe, adding verticality to landscapes and geographical features that would rise up over the horizon as you drew near, mimicking the Earth's curvature. Once the heroes acquired the airship, the world map could be experienced in its full glory, giving a sense of freedom unlike anything else at the time. Battles played out cinematically, using a dynamic camera system to show the action from different angles depending on the actions taken by the player characters and enemies. The game was more like a movie than any console game before it. To add extra weight to the story's most dramatic moments, the game made use of full motion video sequences, like this one of Sephiroth striding through the flames of burning Nibelheim, a scene so iconic it has seared itself into the brains of a whole generation of gamers. The full motion videos and the nearly seamless transitions between video and gameplay were breathtaking at the time. While some of them have aged poorly like this scene with Barrett and Aerith looking like characters out of a Wallace and Gromit episode, Others still look good today, like the scene from the Mount Nebel reactor showing a hideous mutant hatching from its incubator. I do want to set the record straight about something though. These character models used in the field and dungeon scenes with their blocky hands and Lego-like features, there was never any time when gamers looked at this and said, hey, that looks pretty good. We thought they were acceptable, but not impressive. We thought this looked pretty good, and we liked this a lot. Final Fantasy games had always placed a heavy emphasis on story, but the early games told fairly straightforward, not saying bad, fantasy stories filled with tropes like dark gods, evil empires, and magical dimensions. They managed one or two major twists along the way, but for the most part, the stories were traditional and safe. Final Fantasy VII took a bolder approach. With a setting more reminiscent of our own modern world, the game's story was built around complex universal themes like environmentalism, corporate greed, and inequality. Underpinning it all was a very powerful motif of life, death, and loss. These ideas resonated more easily with newcomers to the series and made for a much more memorable experience. The game threw you into the story feet first. There is a term in writing called in medias res, meaning that the story picks up somewhere after the plot has already kicked into gear, and then uses dialogue and flashbacks to fill you in on the backstory as you go along. If you had to pick Final Fantasy VII's inciting incident, the point where the story truly begins, it would be Sephiroth's visit to Nibelheim five years earlier. It is here that Sephiroth learned the truth about his origins and set into motion all of the events that led to the story told in the game. The game could have easily started there, but it didn't. Instead, the game starts you off in Midgar, with Cloud tagging along the bombing run on Mako Reactor No. 1. The writers chose this starting point for two reasons. The first reason is that it got things off to an exciting, action-packed start, and simultaneously threw a bunch of great hooks at the player. Who is Cloud? What is his relationship with Tifa? Why did he quit Soldier? Why are Avalanche bombing the reactor? And who is Sephiroth? There was so much to learn about the world and the characters, and this kept the player engaged in the story. But the other reason is that the game needed to keep you in the dark about Cloud's past in order to run its big scam on you. Namely, that what Cloud says about himself and his past isn't true. By making Cloud one of gaming's first unreliable narrators, Final Fantasy VII set the player up for one of the most shocking twists in gaming history. Cloud's past wasn't the only shocker either. The game's story was a lot more complex than in previous games and packed with mysteries and unexpected twists. The story was surprising and unpredictable and it was told with quite a bit of subtlety. Rather than blurting out the answers to its mysteries, the story often implied things, letting you draw your own conclusions. By deliberately hiding important details about the backstory, such as Cloud's and Zack's escape from Nibelheim, the game gave the feeling there was always more answers out there to be discovered, if only you would search hard enough. Story elements like Cloud's past and the true nature of Sephiroth were so complex and so subtly told that most players would need multiple playthroughs to truly grasp the finer points of the plot. The game also left many questions unanswered. Even after the heroes defeat Sephiroth, the fate of the world still hangs in the balance with no clear answers given. This open-ended conclusion meant that, even after the game was over, players kept coming back for more, discussing the story with their friends, 
interpreting the game's clues and trying to see the story from new angles. Final Fantasy VII's story was a landmark accomplishment. Over time, as storytelling in video games has developed as an art form, our expectations as players have changed. They've changed because of breakthrough moments in video game history, moments when we saw things we'd never seen before, things we didn't think were possible until we saw them. When Sephiroth descended from the pearly light of the City of the Ancients to impale Aerith on the Masamune, and the white materia chimed against the stone in tune with the heart-wrenching soundtrack, that was one of those moments. In that moment, our expectations changed. Video gaming changed. Forever. In any story, if you're only gonna get one thing right, it should be the characters. Final Fantasy VI had featured a large cast of characters, some of whom were more fleshed out than others. While several of the characters had been important to the story, none of them could have been said to be the story's true protagonist. For Final Fantasy VII, Square settled on a smaller cast, focusing more love and attention on each one. They also decided on having a central protagonist around which the story would be told. In Cloud, the Final Fantasy series got its first truly iconic hero. Sorry, Cecil. Yoshitaka Amano's beautiful title designs had been a part of Final Fantasy since the very beginning. The logo he produced for Final Fantasy VII is arguably the most distinctive in the series. I always loved how immediately and obviously the design conveys exactly what it's meant to represent. With his spiky blonde hair, bad attitude, and trademark oversized buster sword, Cloud was a fan favorite from day one. Since the game's release, he's routinely placed in the top of any list of the best or favorite video game characters of all time. Cloud's enduring popularity has ensured that he's been reimagined time and again in spin-offs like Advent Children and Dirge of Cerberus, in ensemble brawlers like Dissidia and Smash Bros, and obviously most recently in Final Fantasy VII Remake. On the surface, Cloud is a cookie-cutter badass, but beneath that flimsy coat of paint, he's one of the most complex characters ever to grace an RPG. His blustering confidence and cool detachment hid a deep-seated insecurity and a fear of giving away too much. Cloud was an awkward, lonely child who never fit in, and when tragedy struck five years before the story begins, he suffered a mental breakdown. Halfway through the game, we realize we don't know Cloud at all. But as the story progresses, and as Cloud works through his fractured memories to discover the truth, we get to know the real Cloud. In the end, our bond with Cloud is so much stronger for having gone through his journey of self-discovery alongside him. It wasn't just Cloud though. Tetsuya Nomura's designs were chic, confident, and cutting-edge cool. This game had style bursting through the seams. Characters like Cloud, Tifa, Sephiroth, and Vincent became style icons that helped set the tone for the whole JRPG genre going forward, for better or worse. Compared to the characters from the previous games, Final Fantasy VII's characters had much more distinct personalities. They all had their little quirks and each of them had their own thoughts and opinions. Sometimes they would argue about how to proceed or just bicker with each other like friends do. These interactions brought life to the characters and made them feel so much more real. They also had complex backstories that intersected meaningfully with the main story and added depth and color to the characters. These subplots included some of the game's most memorable moments, like Red XIII's discovery of the truth about his father's sacrifice, or Barrett's showdown with his old friend, Dine. But what's a story without a great villain? Sephiroth is the coolest, most intimidating, most unforgettable villain in Final Fantasy history, and one of the most iconic villains in all of video gaming history. Kefka may have been more disturbing, but Sephiroth was the better character, and the game told a complete character arc, as Sephiroth turned from celebrated war hero to psychotic mass murderer. We saw Sephiroth search for answers about his own identity, and when the answers he found were more monstrous than he could have imagined, we witnessed his descent into madness as he fully embraced his dark heritage. Sephiroth's actions were reprehensible, but his feelings of alienation and otherness and search for meaning in his own existence were only too human. 
No Final Fantasy game, and indeed few RPGs altogether, have had such an intimate relationship between hero and villain. This time, it was personal. When Cloud left his hometown to join Soldier, it was Sephiroth he was trying to outshine. It was Sephiroth who burned Cloud's hometown of Nibelheim and killed his family and friends. And it was Sephiroth who tormented Cloud and manipulated the Genova cells in his body to make him a puppet to the force of his will. When Cloud faced Sephiroth in the dark void outside of time and space in the final moments before Meteor struck, the showdown represented the culmination of Cloud's whole character arc. The stage was set for a real nail-biter. Instead, we got this. Seeing Omnislash for the first time was a truly mind-blowing experience, and one of the most liberating moments in gaming history. In one furious barrage of blows, Cloud cast aside doubt and fear and rid himself of Sephiroth's influence forever. Here, Cloud fully came into his own, showing that he was no one's puppet. Perhaps the most remarkable accomplishment of Final Fantasy VII lies in its world building. Pre-rendered backgrounds and 3D models allowed for a world that could be filled with an astounding amount of detail. With more places to go, more sights to see and more things to do, the world felt vivid and interactive. And for the first time in a Final Fantasy game, you were drawn in by the environment, becoming immersed in what felt like an actual world that kept on spinning when your back was turned, filled with non-player characters living lives that existed outside of the needs of your adventure. Final Fantasy had always had an eclectic style, but Final Fantasy VII is where Square really hit their stride. It was here that the swirl of bold ideas that was Final Fantasy finally solidified into its own distinctive brand. Crazy alchemy of fantasy tropes, outrageous fashion, and bizarre monsters set in a world that feels at once eccentric and familiar. And when you're looking to explain Final Fantasy VII, you can't overstate the importance of that last word. Familiar. Midgar and the world of Gaia was filled with commuter trains, motorbikes, electric lights, space rockets, and snowboards. This was a world very similar to what the Earth was like when the game was released with the key difference being the existence of Mako energy, acting as a replacement for fossil fuels and a source of supernatural power. The world of Final Fantasy VII wasn't just fascinating, but extremely relatable. It was a world of desperate slum dwellers in neon-lit shantytowns, commuters crowding into train cars, and office high-rises glittering like jewels in the night sky. It was a world where heroes battled private security, suit-wearing thugs, and greedy corporate overlords. It was a world that was, for the most part, painfully recognizable, even to someone who'd never had the least bit of interest in the fantasy genre. In this masterstroke, Square opened up the franchise to all comers and invited the whole world to partake of Final Fantasy. In earlier RPGs, the scenario structure had been pretty straightforward. For the most part, games follow a tried and true gameplay loop of town, dungeon, world map, capping each dungeon with a boss, often followed by some sort of interlude with expository dialogue to set up the next segment. Final Fantasy VII immediately skewed away from this norm by setting the first major chunk of the game all inside the town of Midgar. Not only that, but the environments and scenarios that played out inside Midgar showed amazing imagination and variety. 3D technology meant the game could do so much more than its predecessors could even dream of. The new engine allowed for a wealth of creative scenarios. After a brilliant opening cinematic that set the stage by showing off the city, the game blasted off with a scene where the heroes leaped off of a train and knocked out a pair of guards before rushing off on an urgent mission to bomb a power plant. It was a blistering start, but nothing compared to what was to come. Before the heroes left Midgar, we'd raced from car to car on a commuter train to avoid public security, crawled through the sewers, dressed up in drag to trick a crime lord, and infiltrated a corporate high-rise to rescue a friend from a research laboratory. To cap off the Midgar sequence, a fun motorcycle chase minigame provided an exciting action sequence before sending the heroes out to explore the world map. Before we even got to see the world map, we'd already been through an unforgettable adventure. 
The game had so much variety in its scenarios, and it never pulled on a single string for too long. Dungeons were short, often no more than a few screens, and were often interrupted before story or dialogue. And above all, the scenarios were wonderfully surprising. You never knew what was going to happen next. Coming off of Final Fantasy VI, who in their right mind could have imagined that the next Final Fantasy game would feature a chocobo-themed amusement park and a snowboarding sequence? Final Fantasy VII's soundtrack is one of the most important video game scores of all time. Nobuo Uematsu had been scoring the Final Fantasy series since the very first game. His name was already hallowed to the fanbase, but Final Fantasy VII became the point where he really cemented his legacy as the most famous and beloved composer of video game music in the world. Uematsu saw the transition from Super Nintendo to PlayStation as an exciting opportunity to experiment with things that hadn't been possible to do in the earlier games. One of the things the developers wanted to do was to give the game a theme song with lyrics. This idea had to be scrapped and was eventually pulled off in Final Fantasy VIII. Instead, Uematsu composed One Winged Angel. This track, used in the final battle with Sephiroth, was the first in the series to include a vocal track and made the game's climactic encounter an absolutely spectacular experience. There's a whole generation of gamers out there who still haven't been able to pick their jaws off the ground after first hearing those lyrics kick in. The team wanted a soundtrack that would give the game a more cinematic feel. A soundtrack where each scene would have its own piece of music, though some could be variations on the same tune with its tempo or intensity changed. Although Uematsu had to repeat some pieces of music at times, this overall ambition made the game's compositions more like a film score than a traditional video game soundtrack. The result was an unforgettable masterpiece, melancholic, foreboding, dramatic and energetic as the situation demanded. Final Fantasy VII's soundtrack had a massive impact. It was the first game soundtrack to place in the Japanese music charts. It opened countless people's eyes to the beauty of orchestral music and it was one of the driving forces behind the push that finally shoved video game music over that cusp from having been seen as silly tunes for kids to being celebrated for what it is today. The most diverse, imaginative, freaking amazing genre of music there is. As absurd as it sounds, the actual gameplay was probably Final Fantasy VII's weakest point. The combat system was never all that complex, and the game relied a lot on an excessive number of random encounters to fill out the dungeons. Although the combat system had a decent amount of depth, most of the game could be powered through using normal attacks and a handful of spells. What made the gameplay fun was equipping your characters to maximize their potential. And here we come to the heart of the gameplay, the one key design element on which the whole game was centered. Mako energy crystallized into solid form, Materia was imbued with the memories of the ancients and could grant the heroes access to spells and abilities or simply make them stronger. Materia could be slotted into weapons or armor, combined with other materia to increase their effects, leveled up independently of the heroes and could be traded back and forth between the characters outside of battle. The materia system allowed the player an unprecedented level of character customization. To support this design, the developers stripped the characters of most of their innate abilities. As complex and distinctive as the characters' personalities were, on the battlefield they all handled pretty much the same. Where previous games forced you to pick your party members based on a combination of style and ability, Final Fantasy VII essentially let you pick your party members based entirely on looks and personality. But there was one thing that set the characters apart in battle, and this would be the most famous contribution Final Fantasy VII would make to the franchise. After taking enough damage, a character could unleash a limit break, a flashy, over-the-top special attack that wiped the floor with the enemies. Limit breaks were first seen in Final Fantasy VII and became so popular that most games in the series since have featured some version of limit breaks. But what a lot of people don't know is that the concept of a powerful attack that became available as the character took damage was actually introduced in the previous game. Final Fantasy VI had desperation attacks. When a character was near death, the attack command had a 1 in 16 chance of unleashing a super powerful special attack 
that bypassed all defenses. Unfortunately, the way the game was designed meant there was a good chance a player would complete Final Fantasy VI without ever seeing a desperation attack. By tying access to limit breaks to a special meter that filled up as a character took damage, even if that damage was later healed, Final Fantasy VII's design made sure these impressive attacks occurred often and played an important role in the game. If there is a heaven for grinders, it's gotta look a lot like Final Fantasy VII. The game contained an unprecedented amount of bonus content that extended the game's lifespan well beyond the story's finishing point. The world was filled with hidden treasures like materia, weapons and extra powerful limit breaks. Some areas even hid optional cutscenes that explained some of the game's backstory. Players could capture and breed chocobos, ride them to access remote areas of the map that held amazing rewards, or race them at the gold saucer for unique prizes. There were enemy skills to master, super bosses to challenge, and a wealth of minigames to play. Even after defeating Sephiroth and stopping Meteor, players could easily spend another 100 hours exploring the world, collecting secret rewards and shaping their party into unstoppable killing machines. With all that said, how does the game hold up today? Final Fantasy VII has aged better than most games of its era, but it does look old. Graphics range from really bad to surprisingly good. There are some great visuals in this game, like this part from the Corel Mountains, or the view on the outskirts of Midgar as the parties leaving the city, or the scene where Rufus prepares to fire the cannon at Sapphire Weapon. Random encounters really sucked. My god, sometimes I felt like I couldn't take two steps without hitting another random encounter. I felt like half of the whole game was spent in battles, and the combat honestly bored me. One of the few fights that actually stimulated me was against Lost Number in Shinra Mansion, because this boss would stomp you if you weren't careful. For once, I actually had to pay attention to a fight. Overall, the story didn't hold my interest like it used to. It was really hard not to be influenced by the remake. Dialogue is simplistic and the characters all sound similar. Without voice acting, the game gives the impression of a silent movie. In fact, the whole Midgar sequence feels primitive now, more like a prototype than a finished product. But the best story beats are just as gripping today as 20 years ago. Aerith's death still hit as hard as ever, the Nibelheim flashback was great, and the scene with Sephiroth in the basement of Shinra Mansion gave me chills. The conversation between Cloud and Tifa in the livestream was absolutely brilliant, and the final battle with Sephiroth had my pulse racing. For all its flaws, Final Fantasy VII is still a great game. The crazy thing is that even now, after rushing through the game to gather impressions for this video, I still have an almost overpowering urge to go back into the game and start grinding. I'd love to master that double cut materia and give Tifa the copy, but then I should get Cloud's Apocalypse for the triple AP bonus. So I'll need to beat Ultimate Weapon first, and for that... Sorry, kinda lost my train of thought there. Nostalgia is a powerful thing. It can make you see things others can't. Is the game as good as it was back in 97? No. 23 years ago, Final Fantasy VII was arguably the greatest story-based game ever made. Time has marched on, and video games have seen a great deal of progress in the intervening years. Just like Final Fantasy VII altered our expectations of what was possible, other games have done the same since. You just can't go back and get the same experience I had on Christmas morning of 1997. But that doesn't make the game any less significant than it once was. Final Fantasy VII wasn't the beginning and it wasn't the end, but the game was amazing. As a work of art, it belongs on the wall of the Louvre, right next to the Mona Lisa. It had been over 10 years since I last played Final Fantasy VII. If I had to pick a single scene from the game's story that will stay with me from this playthrough, it's the one between Cloud and Tifa in the livestream. When Cloud is at its lowest point, his mind fractured by Mako poisoning, his spirit shattered by Sephiroth's lies, Tifa patiently helps him put the pieces of his mind back together. It's mesmerizing. More than 20 minutes of pure dialogue and I didn't want it to end. Ever. And then I had this thought. Wow, I can't wait to see this scene in the remake. And that's just the thing, isn't it? I first had this realization during the calm flashback. I was surprised at how well that sequence had held up 
while the Midgar sequence, which had once been my favorite, now felt lackluster. I had to take a step back and be honest with myself. Was it possible that the reason I was enjoying the calm flashback so much was because I hadn't seen it remade yet? Without having anything to compare it to, I could look at these later parts of the story and see the magic of the original game. It was painful to admit, but it was the truth. Now that I've seen what's possible, I can't go back. A bad remake can't ruin the original game, but a good one can. I never asked for a remake, but now that it's here, I feel grateful. The remake is a gift, and I'm so happy that a new generation of teenagers will get a chance to fall in love with these characters and this story, just like I did 23 years ago. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to help me out, please share this video with your friends, subscribe to my channel, and hit that bell to get notified when I upload new videos. And I hope you have a great day.